begin to tease out how things are changing uh, after you've removed sort of the, some of those big drivers of the variability, which are, are things like seasonality and natural flow variations. So that's the first part of the statement. Data without models are chaos. We need a statistical model in order to look at the data. But models without data are fantasy. Um, and the argument is that we, if we just spend all of our energy on modeling some process, um, we may or may not be describing something that has any resemblance to the real world. Um, I, have, uh, I have a reputation for being uh, really tough when, on, on, uh, when I see papers and when I review papers and somebody uses the word data when they're describing the output of a simulation model. And I just pound the table and I say, those are not data, those are model outputs and we need a clear distinction in our mind uh, both have validity and importance, but there is a distinction, uh, and we need to always be comparing model outputs to actual data. And if we don't have it, that comparison with actual data, we're living in a fantasy world. Uh, this quote came from a short paper in Science uh, by Nesbitt and a number of other people. They were actually talking about the subject of global atmospheric methane and the fact that um, there are some trends going on in global atmospheric methane that the scientific community is basically unable to explain, which was this very rapid rise and then a plateau or almost a fall about a decade ago and then another rapid rise. Uh, something as fundamental as methane, such an important greenhouse gas, and yet we don't understand it. And these people were arguing for we need to be able to build a model of how this system is working and organize the data to, to, to kind of get at the pattern so that we can understand this phenomenon. So my bottom line from all of this is that the study of change needs both the use of statistical inference and process-based modeling. Uh, I would also add that within the realm of statistical inference, there's room for diverse approaches to tease out meaningful signals from the noisy data. I published a, a paper a few years ago that was looking for the linkage between flood magnitudes and greenhouse gas concentration, worldwide greenhouse gas concentrations. Because I believe that, that greenhouse effects probably have, and certainly will in the future, affect the nature of flood behavior. In this paper, which I went into really thinking I was going to find that signal, I basically did not find the signal. I said at the end of the paper, it doesn't mean the signal isn't there, it doesn't mean that these relationships won't exist, but we were unable to find it using the methods that we were using, and we stated the encouragement that these kinds of questions need to be looked at by a diverse set of, met of methods, diverse kinds of data sets, uh, in order to try to tease out what's going on, because one of the ways to learn about these phenomena and plan for them is to be able to see uh, the connection between what's happening in the global atmosphere and, and what's happening on the ground and, and to define that, define that connection. So we need a diversity of empirical approaches to see what we can tease out about any of these kinds of connections. So now I'm going to get into stream flow and climate a little bit, and this is a map that many, many people have seen before. Uh, it comes from the, the National Climate Assessment. Uh, the variable being graphed uh, here is the trend in the daily precipitation volume for the 1% daily frequent at the 1% daily frequency between 1958 and 2012, looking at a wide variety of, of climate stations um, within each of several regions of the United States. So they're, what, they're, what they're talking about is, is the event that happens, that is exceeded on only about three days per year, that would be the 1%, three or four days per year, the 1% level, and, and how much that event magnitude has grown over time. And of course, you all are sitting in the, in the bullseye of this graphic, uh, the northeastern United States at a 71% increase, which is a phenomenally large number uh, for an environmental trend over that sort of half decade long, long period. And then other parts of the country they're all kind of on the plus side, almost all on the plus side, um, but generally they're all somewhat less, uh, and some of them are statistically significant and some are not, but the northeastern one was certainly statistically significant. 
This map raises a set of questions in my mind. Uh, the first one is the climate models that we depend on uh, for planning purposes. Um, my question would be, can the climate models produce patterns like this? If you run any number of climate models, will you see outcomes, when you run it in hindcast mode, will you see outcomes that look anything like this? Uh, that includes the, the very high number for the Northeast and then this great variation across the different parts of the country. That's one way that one could, uh, one could go about attempting to verify, uh, or and, and verify is too strong a word, I should say, um, what we're really talking about is, is getting some evidence that the models are pointing us in the right direction. So we need to look at the models and see whether they would produce something like this. My next question as a hydrologist is do stream flow statistics show trends that are consistent with this? And, and the obvious thing that comes to mind is, um, well, if the, if the intense precipitation is increasing, certainly floods must be increasing. It's a very logical connection. But in fact, what is happening? Do we see that increase in flooding? Uh, and, and that's really the third question. What are the implications for flood hazards? Um, so I'm going to just zero in on one example of a river in, a, in an area that hasn't seen a lot of change on the ground uh, over the last uh, century or so, the Little Androscoggin River near South Paris, uh, Maine. Uh, it's a 190 square kilometer watershed. And this is the complete hydrologic record of stream flow at this particular site. It's plotted here on a logarithmic scale. It runs from 1930, about 1930 to 20, 2016. Um, and, the, and the questions I would ask is, can the models uh, create patterns like this? And, and there, there's a lot of things going on here. Uh, there's, of course, there's tremendous amount of seasonality to this, but there's also a tremendous amount of clumpiness to this with various periods that are um, several years in which uh, many of the values are low, and other years, sets of years in which there's a lot of high values. And we also just see this enormous variability running over about five orders of magnitude. Um, uh, so, the, and, then the, and this is what I mean by data without models are chaos, because how would you characterize something that sort of has this very wild looking sort of behavior? Um, here's one way to characterize it, very simplistic, um, and it just says simply, what's the mean discharge for each year in that record? So the black dots are the mean, uh, and, and uh, the, the, the uh, black line is simply a low S smooth, a, 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 a statistical smoothing algorithm, and what it's telling us was that things were really pretty flat, pretty, pretty non-trending up to about 1990, and we, we see something sort of picking up with, with representing some increased discharge. And in fact, this is something we, we might expect because of the greenhouse effect, which is a sort of a general wetting of the system, and that it, it, it's happened in the last 20 or 30 or so years. Um, another variable we could look at, however, is the maximum day. We simply pick off the maximum day of every single year, every single year and we record um, those values. Um, there are a couple of things that come to, that are notable here is one that was when you do a general smoothing of this time series, you don't see very much trend at all. Uh, maybe a slight upwards turn toward the end, but if you do a statistical hypothesis test, you really come out saying we don't see a change at all. The other thing that's so interesting about it is these three very high outliers and that's something that's really typical in, in, in when you work with flood statistics, which is that the large floods can be very, very large indeed. Um, and that's really something that can be expected. And, um, and uh, statistically, it's very hard to characterize these things. And one can easily be sort of fooled into believing that something fundamental has changed just because you happen to be in the year when one of those extreme events occur. Um, so we don't see a strong indication of an upwards trend in the maximum day. Um, we can look at the minimum day. So this is a, 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 a measure that's, that um, is often used in the regulatory arena for, and, the, and the habitat, um, work related to habitat, is the seven day minimum. So it's the seven consecutive days of the year that have the lowest flow. And we've recorded that. And it looks rather like the mean flow record. 
in the sense of being fairly flat, maybe downward slightly, and then turning up somewhere, say, in the, in the 1990s. Um, and I'm not going to get into my hypotheses about what's driving this particular system. I'm simply going to say, here are some diverse ways of characterizing that system as one begins to try to understand what might be driving it. Um, everyone always tells me that hydrologic variability, variability has been increasing over time, or another, other people will say hydrologic variability will increase with an increase in greenhouse gases. Um, it's a very plausible statement. Um, but I always ask the question, well, what's your metric of variability? How are you, you know, what are you, what are you measuring that, that tells you that there is this increase in variability? A metric that I happen to like is, is a 21 year, and that could be a 15 year, it could be a 25 year, 21 seemed reasonable to me, a 21 year moving standard deviation of the logarithm of the daily discharge. And by taking the logarithms, I render this to be a, a, a dimensionless a measure of, of uh, variability. It's a lot like a coefficient of variation, but it has better sampling properties than that. And, and you may have situations, and we do see these around the country, places where average, the average level of flow has gone up substantially, uh, particularly true in the northern prairies of the United States. But we want to know what's going on in terms of the variability about that mean, uh, so we have this non-dimensional measurement um, of variability. Um, this the black line on here from running from 1940 to mid-2000s, uh, the 2000s, uh, is that moving standard deviation of the daily stream flow, of the log of the daily stream, uh, stream flow. And what we can see is that it is virtually flat. And I've looked at this statistic at many, many locations all over the United States. And except for some places where major dams have been gone in or major dams have been removed, most places I see a essentially flat behavior and even in some cases a slight downwards turn. Now, um, that's a definition of variability. What's your definition of variability? Can we document that it's increasing? So there's a kind of uh, conventional wisdom or mythology that goes along with some of these issues of climate change. And I I'm here to sort of challenge them and say, show me that in fact variability is increasing because I'm still, a, I'm sort of a non-believer uh, on that issue at this point. Um, these are just the, the set of graphs, the set of four graphs that I just showed you, and I'll put in briefly here a shameless plug for my own software. It's R code, it's open access, it's called, the, the software is called EGRIT, which stands for Exploration and Graphics for River Trends. It's available on plan, and almost all of the graphics that you see in this talk were produced with EGRIT, which deals both with water quality issues as well as stream flow issues. And we're adding, we'll be adding more and more sort of diagnostic kinds of analyses and graphics over time to help people try to try to make some sort of sense out of the out of this chaos, which is our, our hydrologic data. So this is just one example of with one sim, a single one-line command, one can produce uh, a graphic like that with the egret software. This is another way to look at the exact same data set. Here I've, I've arbitrarily uh, split it into equal one-third parts of the record. So the black is the earliest third of the record, the green is the middle third, and the red is the last third of the record. And if you think back, think back to the map that I showed you that showed the uh, uh, increase in, uh, in, in high precipitation days, those were at the 1% level on the, on the flow duration curve. The blue line here is at the 1% flow duration level at this site. Um, and in terms of stream flow, we, you know, it's, you'd have to take out a microscope to find the change. Now, there are other sites where that's not necessarily the case, but again, translating from that result about precipitation over to the subject of stream flow doesn't necessarily follow uh, on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, and what's interesting here is that the real change over this time period is at the low flow end, and if you go to the far left edge of this graph at the low flow end, what you find is that the recent period um, has much lower lows. And I think this is a widespread phenomenon that we, we really need to try to understand because, in fact, these are the flows that are so important to the aquatic ecosystem and to water supply. Um, another way of looking at the same data set, and this is some work that I've done with my colleague uh, um, Stacy Archfield, a, a fairly recent PhD out of Tufts University, um, and we're looking at here, again, it's the very same record, 
and we look at all events above 24.2 cubic meters per second, how did we pick 24.2 cubic meters per second? It is the discharge level such that in a base period, which we define as 1940 through 1969, there were an average of two events per year. Two times a year, the flow went up above that level of 24.2 cubic meters per second. So the question is, we wanted to ask is, or actually there was a series of questions. Are these events, which could be small floods all the way up to very large floods, are these events getting more frequent? Are they lasting longer? Or do they have a larger volume? And, and do they have a higher peak day? So there's four trend questions that we're trying to get at uh, out of this particular data set. Um, this graphic here is simply identical to the graph I just showed you, except we've sliced off uh, at 24.2 cubic meters per second, and we're only showing you the excursions above that level because our focus in this particular study was on the high flow phenomenon. And I think you can see, looking at this, that the density of these spikes up above that level is getting greater as you move towards the present as compared to the earlier part of, the, of this record. Um, and so this is a graphic um, that, that every circle on here represents the number of these events occurring in each water year from 1940 all the way to 2013. Uh, so there are anywhere from zero events, and the, and the greatest was that there would be seven events per year. Uh, and we did a man Kendall chest for trend on it and say, indeed, this thing is going up. There was an increasing number of events. Um, and if, uh, another way of characterizing it is to say the frequency of these events has gone from an average of two per year in the base period to an average of 3.3 per year since 1990. Um, and in fact, when we do this across a whole variety of sites uh, throughout New England, we find results generally like this, which is that the frequency of these high flow events uh, has unquestionably increased um, uh, over the last uh, 60 or 70 years. Um, but then when we look at the discharges on those days, the, those particular events, all the big events in this record, uh, we find essentially no trend at all. The red line is a low S smooth through it. The statistical test basically says the p-value is 0.7. It's a, it's, a, it's a slight decrease, but it's a non-significant decrease. Uh, we look at the volume, how much water, and that would be a question if one was trying to design flood control. Uh, you really want to know about the volume of the events. Well, it's basically showing us no signal at all, basically no trend. And the duration of the events, basically no trend. Now, I should point out that in other parts of the country, some of these variables show up very significantly, that we have larger, larger volume events, but we don't seem to see that, or larger peaks, but we don't seem to see that in New England. So it's, it's a, a recognition that, that this is a sort of a very multifaceted phenomena, and we need uh, to look at it in a, in a multifaceted way to really understand what's going on. I want to just real quickly compare three sites in New England. So I just showed you the Little Androscoggin. Not terribly far away from that is the Ammanusik River in, in New Hampshire, which does, whose headwaters is up in the presidential range and it flows toward the west. And then finally, a somewhat smaller watershed down in Connecticut, the Bunnell Brook. Um, on the Ammanusik River, when we look at the frequency of events per year, uh, we basically don't see this trend happening at all. The two-sided p-value in the trend test is 0.5. The average number of events has gone from two per year in the base period to 2.2% per year since 1990. Essentially, no change. Why do we have, within a reasonably small area, some places that are showing this big increase in frequency, others that don't? These are some of the kinds of things that need to be teased out of the data, looking at things like watershed characteristics, climate kind of conditions, to try to understand uh, these, what, what the drivers are of these changes and of these different kinds of changes at different sites. If we go down to Connecticut to Bunnell Brook and we do this look at annual event counts, um, we get a two-sided p-value of 0.002, in other words, extremely significant results. And we see that instead of two events per year in the base period, we're now at, in recent years at about 4.1 events per year, and also some of the measures of, of, of volume, et cetera, uh, have increased. And I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip one slide and move on. So moving on from the sort of stream flow, well, just a few more thoughts about stream flow. So the questions one has to ask is, do we have an up-to-date characterization of stream flow for the design and management purposes? And that includes characterizing low flows, high flows, 
seasonal variations, etc. Um, are we using the data to test to de deterministic models of change using model hindcast to see if the changes that we observe, like the ones I just showed you, whether they are similar to things that the, that the modeling uh, methodologies would give us? Are we using the data to inform us of widespread changes in their possible causes, looking over a broad region and trying to see what's the nature of the change that's going on there? Um, and are we observe, are we, and are we operating observational networks that will help us characterize change on into the future? And in the case of this example, it would be the stream gauging network that would provide us with that information moving into the future. Now I'm going to shift gears to the subject of water, of surface water quality. Um, briefly just mentioned that here's the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Here's a set of 117 stations in which water quality is being measured. They take about 20 samples per year, 12 of them on a sort of a calendar monthly basis, eight of them uh, focused on high flow events because the interest here is understanding the loadings of what's going out of these rivers and ultimately into Chesapeake Bay. And so we want to purposely bias our sampling in the direction of the, the higher flow events and then use statistical methods to take this purposely biased record and turn it into an unbiased estimate of what's, what's happening in the system. 20 samples per year. We also have daily discharge. And I, just a comment here that I'll, I'll make a very broad generalization, but I really feel very strongly about it. Any attempt to study the quality of a river and it's taking samples, measuring the chemical concentrations in that river, if it's done in the absence of information about stream flow, it's basically worthless. It's only when you can look at it in the context of what's with the dynamics of the river and the flow that's going on, only then does that chemical data begin to actually take on, in my opinion, take on any real meaning. Um, I'm, I'm pretty fanatic about that point. Um, and then so finally, we take dis daily discharges at all sites, and we're looking for trends in load. And it's critical to say that. We're looking for trends in load. The issue to the people who run this network is mostly about what's happening in terms of what's going into Chesapeake Bay. It's not an, a focus on concentration. Now, locally, there may be concerns about concentration of something that might be harmful in that flowing river, but the interest here is in loads. The point I want to make is a study of what's happening to loads can lead to very different results than a study which is focused on changes in concentration, because that concentration is really looking equally, giving equal weight to all days of the year, whereas the study of load has a very high focus on those high flow days, because that's when most of the load is transported. Uh, there's a lot of data analysis issues looking at the kinds of these kinds of data. The tremendous variability, flows are, the concentrations are highly related to stream flow and to season, they're highly skewed, they're sometimes censored, that means they have less than values among them for certain kinds of constituents. Um, and the, and a, the really difficult part of all of this is that assessments of progress uh, can be easily obscured by the random but persistent pattern of wet and dry years. Um, that nature, you know, hydrology is naturally very clumpy. Um, and wet years tend to follow wet years, and dry years tend to follow dry years, and water quality is very responsive to the flow conditions. And I call this the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat syndrome. And I'll show you a very simple story that sort of illustrates that. Um, these are estimates of the annual flux, the loading uh, of total phosphorus on the Potomac River going past Washington, D.C. on its way to Chesapeake Bay. Um, so the fluxes are intended to six uh, kilograms per year, millions of kilograms per year. And, and this is a record if, as if we had stopped this at the, at the end of water year 2002. Um, and, and I call this the thrill of victory. And there were literally people involved in the water quality issues of the Potomac River Bay, of the, of the Chesapeake Bay watershed, say, we have success. We have brought these, and these loadings down. We have brought the concentrations down. We are doing great. Um, and uh, let's declare victory. Um, however, if we look at the discharge record for the exact same set of years, these are the mean flows, what you see is that those last four years of the record that had such low values for phosphorus also have very low values for flow. Uh, obviously, there's some kind of a relationship going on. Um, then, so then what I'm going to do here is show you an additional five more years of this record. And this is what I call the, the agony of defeat, which is after these four very, very low years, 
uh, the concentrations and the discharge skyrocketed. And they skyrocketed simply because this was, 2003 was an extremely wet year. It wasn't a flood year, it just had persistently very, very high flows. The next year was fairly high and actually it began to tail off. And in fact, it's very easy for one to sort of say, oh, I think there's a bunch of trends in this. This is, these are not trends, these are just the kind of typical variations that you see in long-term records. So that's what I call the agony of defeat. Here's the flow record over that same period of time, and what we see is the flow record looks a lot like the phosphorus record, uh, because the phosphorus record is so, so, so much driven by the flow conditions. And my comment here is Homer Simpson saying, duh, it's all about the flow. Uh, that are, an attempt to understand what's happening in water quality is, is really uh, obscured by this purely natural sort of variation that's going on in the stream flow record. So my point is, first of all, that the history of the actual loadings can be very useful if we are talking to the ecologist who is trying to understand the drivers of the, in the receiving water body. How did the, the aquatic ecosystem respond to the actual inputs of phosphorus that, that occurred in any given year? But that history of loadings in and of itself is not useful for assessing progress. Progress in, because it's over, being overwhelmed by the random year-to-year -year variations in stream flow. I'd say we're, we're smarter than Homer. We can deal with the influence of flow. And I'm going to show you how we do that. It's a, a method called weighted regressions on time discharge and season, WRTDS, uh, and also an associated method for looking at the uncertainty in that. Uh, these are methods that I developed back um, about six years ago and have been published and, and been used a number of times and are included in the software I mentioned. And I'll use an example from the eastern shore of Maryland, uh, east, east of the Chesapeake Bay, uh, very highly agricultural watershed. And here is one of these very noisy data sets. These are all the samples that have been taken at this site uh, for dissolved orthophosphate um, over, this, over this period of time. And you can, you can see that there's some kind of a trend going on, uh, but you can also say, boy, is it noisy, and it'd be really hard to, to really grasp what's going on just looking at the data uh, as it is. Um, the WRTDS method uses um, concepts from statistical smoothing uh, recognizing that, that concentrations are a function of, of year, they're a function of season, and a function of flow, and they have a lot of random variation. And this graphic uh, is, is, an, is an illustration of that. It's a contour plot where the contours represent the expected value of concentration for any combination of day and discharge throughout this entire period of record. Um, and you can read the papers to find out exactly how this was done. But one of the things it's obviously showing is that, uh, that over time, particularly as you get past about 2005, at the higher flows in certain times of year, um, higher and higher concentrations of, of orthophosphate are occurring. And it's interesting, it's a dissolved constituent. We usually expect dissolved constituents to decrease with flow, but here they're increasing, which represents some movement of soil water uh, rapidly through the subsurface, um, some cases into tile drains and moving into the river. So that's a representation of the system. Um, uh, this model, this is, this is what I'm talking about having, you know, uh, data, you need a model to understand what's going in the data. This is our statistical model. It provides a very detailed description of change and in my work and in the work of my colleagues, we sort of exploit this statistical model in a whole variety of ways to make statements about the nature of the change that's going on and comparing it across sites, across seasons, etc. I won't get into all of those uses, but uh, managers want answers to two simple questions. Is it getting better or worse? And what's the rate of change? Um, and we can take the information that's in here and simplify it down to the answers that they're looking for. We do that by integrating this surface over the seasonal frequency distribution of discharge to get something we call flow normalized annual flux. Um, and the green line on here is the flow normalized annual flux for this site. It's basically said we're, we're integrating out the, the variability, year-to-year -year variability in stream flow. It still recognizes that there's a huge natural variability in stream flow. It's looking over the whole distribution, but it's removing the effect of year-to-year -year change 
in stream flow. The dots represent our best estimate of the actual flux in any particular 